Welcome back everyone. Today we are doing our portfolio update, not on Monday, we were just too busy. But here we are on the Google spreadsheet for our portfolio. Welcome to those of you who are new to the channel. This is our charity portfolio where Guy and I have set aside $5,000 each and we are managing it and hopefully one day the dividends of this portfolio are going to be big enough so that we can use it for charity purposes. With respect to last week, we actually have a new entry now in the portfolio. This is also the reason why we are still working here on this line, so you will not find the gross margin, the operating margin, and etc. for this new holding. But hopefully in a few days, we're just going to update it. But of course, if you want to know a little bit more about it, you can go, for example, to FinChat. We have an affiliate link in the description down below if you want to purchase one of their paid plans and get a discount on it, where you can actually learn more about our new holding, which is Burberry, as you might have seen from the ticker. And you can get to know their operating margin and other metrics. So as you can see, the position that we have opened occupies now around 2.3% of our portfolio. And we can actually maybe go even to, to FinChat and we can take a quick look at Burberry. And you can see that in the past few weeks and actually months, the stock price has decreased quite a lot. We had a maximum of around 25 pounds and now we bought it at around 12 pounds. So basically we have been talking with guy offline about it we haven't shared anything on the channel just not to influence anyone and also not to influence kind of like ourselves maybe hearing what you guys might have thought or, or might think about burberry but so guy this has been a company under quite a lot of stress recently and maybe during the week if we have time we're gonna listen to one of the earnings call maybe the most recent one on, on feed chat as we have anticipated uh, in the last week but maybe in a few words, the reason why we decided to open a position in Burberry is that on, on one side, the stock price has decreased. And of course, that's not enough, right? Because we have to look at the fundamentals. But we think that maybe the market is being too pessimistic about this company. And as is the case also with some of the very few other companies in the portfolio, this is not the case of a compounder, as we might regard, for example, Meta but it might be more of a value play if you want that every now and then we could do in the portfolio, even though, and especially this is for those of you who are new, the long-term goal of the portfolio is to be fully invested in equities, in stocks, even though now, unfortunately, we have this 40%, around 40% position in short-term bonds because we have started this portfolio at the end of 2022 and we haven't found many good opportunities so as to be able to allocate 100% of the portfolio in equities. But yeah, Burberry, is the new entry and we regard it as a value play, right? Given our analysis of the financial statements, we think that Barbary is very cheap at the moment. Of course, they are under some stress for idiosyncratic reasons, for reasons that are specific to them, but they are on top of the issues that they have. So we don't believe that, or at least we, we believe that the risk reward at this level is skewed and uh, we are not entering at a point where we believe that there's the same probability of the stock going down than going up from the point of view of the stock itself also they have a, a good dividend yield that should help us in case the recovery will be slow but of course as with any other position in the portfolio when we open a position first of all we are ready to increase it if the price continues to go down. Second of all, when we open a position, we open it with the idea that we are not gonna sell it in a short while. So for us, this could uh, be a position for a few years. And so we, on the one hand, we don't know if, of course, the price will go up and down in the next few weeks and months, but we think that there's a reasonable chance that it will improve. And I guess that this week's video on the earnings call on Burberry might answer some of the questions that you might have on why we have decided to open this position. So we're just going to wait for that video to get into more details about Burberry. And just quickly again, if I go back to the portfolio location, and as I said, we still have around 40% in short-term bonds. And if we look at what happened last week, we can see just for example at Meta, that is our largest position has gained around 2%. Google has also gained 3%. We have NVIDIA that still got a plus 5%. I mean, we don't own NVIDIA in our portfolio. And then we have the other companies. This is also another 
play that we talked about also last week because we have covered the shareholders meeting by Fundsmith. They've lost around 4%. One interesting uh, thing that I observed is that uh, one of the stocks that uh, we have in our watch list, that is Nike, went down 7% in the last week and about 10% in the last month. So it seems that they could become interesting very soon. And then to conclude, our overview on the Kelly criterion. We would like to talk about this paper by Edward Thorpe and uh, others. Uh, Thorpe, of course, is the famous author of Beat the Dealer, but also he is a mathematician. And back in the days, he had a hedge fund, very famous one, Princeton uh, Newport Partners, PNPs. Thorpe, basically in this paper, discusses the application of the Kelly criterion to the stock market, besides other things. And the part that is mo the most inter interesting for us is around page 925. This is continuous gambling games. And basically, in that section, they discuss how they model the distribution function of stock returns and how can they use the Kelly framework to try to infer something about the optimum leverage in the stock market. Of course, under some modeling assumptions, and this is always something that we should keep in mind that all these models sometimes could diverge from reality. This is an important, let's say, caveat that we should always remember. In this case, for example, one of the assumptions made on page 927, an application to the US stock market, is that stock price changes behave like independent, identically distributed random variables. So it means that the price tomorrow is independent from the price today, but the distribution is not completely random. So it, it, the distribution can be modeled and uh, it, it follows some particular shape. And here they assume that the shape is something like the one on figure three, that is on page 929. And of course, also this is not completely realistic. So there are several, let's say, uh, approximate assumptions in what they show. But the beauty of this paper is that they show us a framework and we could just change slightly the assumptions to get to our own conclusions. But anyway, if we accept their assumptions, then the most important thing, I think, for us is what they conclude in terms of the leverage or the optimum leverage to use in the stock market in case all the assumptions are correct. This is what they report below equation five. So they say that numerically, optimizing numerically the Kelly criterion under these assumptions, it seems that the optimum leverage to use is 17% because it's F star equal 1.17. And also another interesting thing that they conclude is on the last page of the paper. And is that what is the leverage that with very high probability would lead to ruin? And according to these computations, is very close to 70%, so 1.7. So in some sense, this is telling us that according to all these assumptions, a little bit of leverage is good in the sense that it maximizes the growth rate of just a leveraged long S&P 500 portfolio. But if the leverage is not much, much higher than that, so 70%, then there would be basically ruin almost for certain. And let's now go a little bit to macro just for the very end of the video and let's listen to Larry Summers. And I find their view that the ultimate neutral rate is 2.6 to be bizarre in uh, current circumstances. Here's what we have relative to a few years ago when they said it was 2.5. We've got fiscal policy in a much, much more expansionary place with much higher deficits, much larger role of debt. That puts pressure on credit markets. We've got a huge set of new private sector investments going on with respect to green investment in the IRA, going on with respect to resilience and uh, reducing dependence on single 
uh, sources. We've got a potential huge source of demand for chips and for electricity coming out of the AI revolution. And we've got a huge wealth effect as markets in for both housing and stocks have run way up for the last few years. So with all of those impulses to demand, I cannot understand why someone would form the view that the neutral rate was essentially the same as they, as they thought it was uh, four years ago. And I think the neutral rate is far more likely to have a four handle on it right now than it is to have a two handle. Okay, guys, so here Larry is talking about the interest rates and the fact that the Fed is not easing for now. And the neutral rate might be very different than what people have thought in the past. Yeah, so essentially the Fed's view is that the neutral rate is 2.5. So rate cuts are warranted for that reason, because otherwise they would be tightening now too much. But he listed a few things that happened in the world and that structurally changed the economy compared to before. So his view is that it's more like four. And what does it mean for us? I mean, in the end, this, this stuff is almost unknowable, right? Because we here, if we think about it from <laughs> a distance, we have Larry Summers, of, of course, a very brilliant economist saying something, the Fed with 900 PhDs or whatever, saying another thing. So it, it's, it's very strange, right? Essentially, we cannot know this stuff. But if Larry Summers is correct, then it means that in the future, interest rates will need to be slightly higher than in the past. So that this thing that we are coming back to, I don't know, 2.53, whatever, is probably not going to happen. However, if the Fed eases, so if he's correct and the Fed eases, then probably we are going to see more inflation. Of course, because it would be easy monetary policy, at least inflation that is created by easy monetary policy. So maybe asset inflation, who knows? On the other hand, of course, if Larry Summers is wrong, so if the Fed is correct, then they will ease and we will have this very beautiful soft landing. And if they did not ease, we would have had probably a recession that would have been induced by excessive tightening. So the risk here is that since it seems that they will cut rates, inflation could pick up again. But then if that happens, rates will need to be increased, like basically in the 70s. So this is one risk, and we cannot do much, actually, about it. The other risk is that actually, since they say that they are data dependent, maybe they don't cut. And so maybe Larry Summers is just correct, is just saying what is going to happen. They will not cut because inflation will be sticky and uh, it will not go down to two. And so in that case, we should settle basically to a situation where the discount rate that we need to use is a little bit higher than before. So typically we use a 5% or slightly above that, right? A 5% discount rate. And I think we, we are mostly fine because even if the neutral rate is 4%, if we use 5, more or less, it should be fine. And we have always done this because, of course, Warren Buffett says that you should use the long-term yield for the discount rate. And also, maybe the, the long-term yield was slightly below 5, but we used 5 because it was easier and slightly above, so it was a little bit more conservative. On the other hand, uh, this is interesting because uh, what happens if there's a new inflation wave? So if Larry Summers is correct, the Fed is wrong, they cut, a new inflation wave starts. Then in that case, this 5% discount rate that we believe is conservative now will probably be not conservative anymore. So there is still a risk for us. I mean, we, we tend to be more conservative, right? So we want to be on the safe side with our assumptions. And so we believe right now that a 5% discount rate is more or less okay, it does make sense. But we can also see that there's a scenario where we could need to adjust the discount rate higher. And there was, for example, Greenblatt saying that when the interest rates are below some level, he uses six or seven percent, I don't remember. So there are other value investors that when the interest rates are too low, they still anyway use a, an even higher interest rate. So we will see what happens. And this excerpt basically is telling us as value investors what could go wrong if 
the discount rate that is assumed, like we do, is quote unquote only 5%. So this is one more reason, right, to be interested in this YouTube channel and to follow our journey. So one more reason to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and going back to how we open the video, if you're interested on Burberry and also just in general on the thought process and this kind of like new series that we want to start on the channel, kind of like hearing, listening to the earnings call using FinChat, you can just subscribe and wait for next video because that's exactly what we are going to do. And if you're also interested in FinChat, you can just go to the description of each video and maybe use one of the affiliate links. In the meantime, have a good day and we're going to see you soon. Bye-bye.